Oh, my name is Marie Harms, as Samantha said, and I'm the program director and plow trainer at the State Library of Iowa. Today, I will give you an overview of what web accessibility means and then talk about some best practices and practical solutions for accessibility in the Plow Concrete CMS platform. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll understand the components of what makes a website accessible and apply that knowledge to your own Plow website. So accessibility is about designing for everybody, not just the few. And it's not about designing just for the disabled. It is about designing for every one of us and good accessibility or inclusive design benefits all of us. So here's a description of some of the types of disabilities. We have technical disabilities and that can occur when poorly designed websites are not responsive to be viewed on a smartphone or when a website is bloated and cannot load over a slow internet connection. Users with visual impairment need high contrast, big buttons, font, and links. Users with cognitive disabilities may have difficult reading and understanding dense text or may be distracted by blinking text. Motor challenges can occur when having to rely on using a mouse to navigate the website. People with arthritis or a repetitive strain injury can have difficulty on a website. And then we have screen reader compatibility. You may think that making your site or app friendly for screen readers only benefits the visually impaired. You would be wrong. In fact, many people use text to speech every day. Do you ever turn on subtitles when you watch a Netflix show? You may have heard of the concept of universal design. Designing furnishing, housings, books, and yes, websites should be designed for everyone. Although making our web pages accessible should be motivated, by a desire to make our libraries available and welcoming to all regardless of the ability level, there are some laws that affirm the rights of disabled people to access our programs and define our responsibilities to make our programs available. Here's a summary of major federal laws governing web accessibility for us. Section 504 of the US Rehabilitation Act says that this law establishes that no individual shall solely by reason of disability be excluded from the part participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity conducted by a federal agency or institution receiving federal assistance. Section 508 of the United States Rehabilitation Act specifically says, this law requires that individuals with disabilities who are members of the public seeking information or services from a federal agency have access to and use of information and data that is comparable to that provided to the public who are not individuals with disabilities, unless an undue burden would be imposed on the agency. Obligations to comply with Section 508 can be extended to state and local level participation in certain federal programs, and that includes libraries. And then we have the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, sometimes referred to as the ADA. And this is a wide ranging legislation intended to make American society more accessible to people with disabilities. This extends the requirements of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 to all public and commercial facilities, with few exceptions, not just those that receive federal funding. And it also requires that every institution that does receive federal funds establishes and maintains a plan of compliance. And you should know that lawsuits have been filed against various non-federal agencies for inaccessible websites using the ADA. Now, 
making pages accessible. The following information is taken from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, sometimes called the WCAG or WCAG 2.0. And this, um, this guidelines includes several web accessibility tutorials and guidance on how to create websites that meet WCAG. Next, I will talk about the essential components of web accessibility. The underlying tenet of web accessibility is that it is essential that several different components of web development and interaction work together in order that the web be accessible to people with disabilities. These components include content, The content, the information in a web page or a web application, including natural information such as text, images, and sounds. And on your plow sites using concrete CMS, this is what you have the most control over. The code is another component. The code or the markup that defines the structure and the presentation of how the website appears. This is how concrete CMS was built and what goes into the CSS, the templates, and how it works as a whole content management system. The next component is the web browser or media players or other user agents. And this is how people interact with a website. Browser companies are constantly updating and changing their browsers. So it works or doesn't work between the developer and how adept you are as a user at using all the features and elements of the browser. As you know, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and Safari all work just a little bit differently. Assistive technology is a term for assistive, adaptive, or rehabilitative devices for people with disabilities or the elderly population. People with disabilities often have difficulty performing activities of daily living independently or even with assistance. And this of course includes navigating around a website. Assistive technology for this could include screen readers, alternative keyboards, switches, scanning software, text-to-speech, and so forth. Another component is the user's knowledge, experiences, and in some cases, using those adaptive strategies using the web. Another component is developers. Developers are the ones who make the websites or the content management systems like concrete, like concrete CMS that you use. And this group could include designers, coders, authors, and also includes developers with disabilities and users who contribute content. Authoring tools include software that creates websites and is the collaborative authoring for websites that may include text and embed graphics, photo, video, audio, maps, and program code that display content and interact with the user. As you know, Concrete CMS is a web template to create your own website. You use these authoring tools yourself to create the website. And finally, there are evaluation tools. Web accessibility evaluation tools such as HTML validators, CSS validators, or programs anyone can run on their website to check adherence to WCAG. There are companies that you can pay to do this, and there are some free tools for this too. So here is an illustration of how it all works together. Web developers usually use authoring tools and evaluation tools to create web content. People or the users use web browsers, media players, assistive technologies, and other user agents to get and interact with the content. So you can see that librarians who create websites using concrete CMS 
are actually in the blue side and in the tan side. So authoring and as well as users. Fortunately, Silo has provided a content management system that has many accessibility functions built in. And here are some of the things that Concrete CMS does well. It has built-in accessibility in the design and it was coded for accessibility. And as you know, it provides web authoring tools to help you create content that is accessible. It contains a WYSIWYG editor that includes word wrapping. The content adding tools to encourage accessibility such as the alt tag on images. And I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. For the most part, con Concrete CMS is a navigable using just the keyboard. And the exception is the drop down menus. And I'll give a demonstration of that in a little bit too. Next, we'll talk about how to create websites that need WCAG or the web content accessibility guidelines. They are a part of a series of web accessibility guidelines published by the Web Accessibility Initiative of the World Wide Web Consortium, the main international standards organization for the internet. They are a set of recommendations for making web content more accessible, primarily for people with disabilities but also for all user agents, including highly limited devices, such as mobile phones. So you can see there's a lot of people, a lot of thought that's going into this, setting these guidelines. So some of the guidelines include the page structure. Accessible page structure depends on the use of headers, colors with good contrast, and using large links, large buttons, and controls. Fortunately for us, Concrete CMS users have these functions are available in the content editor. So when you've added a text block and seen this content editor, you can see that there are different fonts to choose from, different font sizes you can set, header sizes, which is found under that normal drop-down menu there, and text color and text highlighting colors. The other thing that this content editor provides is automatic word wrapping, which is important for screen readers. So what Concrete CMS has done for us is built all of this into this WYSIWYG editor that we don't have to think about it. We don't have to do it by hand. The next content piece are menus. Menus are used for navigation and to provide functionality, which are critical parts of web operability. We have structure, which may include the markup menus in a way that reflect their structure and appropriately labels them. We have styling, which is commonly recognized design patterns to distinguish menus and the state of menu items. So whether it turns a different color or it moves somehow, it will allow those menus to um, be used styling. And then we have something called flyout menus, but the guidelines say to ensure flyout or drop down submenus can be used appropriately with a mouse and keyboard. And I discovered that this is one thing that does not really work very well without a mouse in our concrete CMS and our PLA websites. So we can get to the tabs, but the drop down using just the keyboard doesn't work. And another style element are the images. We have informative images, decorative images, and functional images. When we add images to our concrete CMS websites, we have the ability to add the alt tag in the image properties. This is what the screen reader reads. So the alt tag must be accurate and descriptive. And on the information, informative images, these are images that are graphically represent content concepts and information, typically pictures, photos, and illustration. The text alternative should be at least a short description conveying the essential information presented by the image. So for example, use the word telephone with this illustration. 
And then we have decorative images, which we see a lot of on our PLOW websites. Then that can, um, the purpose of that image is to add visual decoration to a page rather than to convey information that is important to understanding the page. Functional images are text of an alternative, text alternative of an image used as a link or as a button that describes the functionality of the link or the button rather than the visual image. So examples of such images are a printer icon to represent the print function or a button to submit a form. And you can see where it would be important to include an alt tag if a screen reader is reading this. So we can see what this little magnifying glass means, but an alt tag described as a magnifying glass is not very descriptive of what it does. A better tag would be to use the word search. On tables, the guidelines say that data tables are used to organize data with a logical relationship in grids. Accessible tables need HTML markup that indicates header cells and data cells and defines a relationship. Assistive technologies use this information to provide context to the users. So for example, header cells must be marked up with the TH tag and data cells with the TD tag to make tables accessible. And here you can see that the source code from Con Concrete CMS does include the proper markup for tables. Forms. Forms should have labeling controls such as the submit or send. Use the label element to identify the form control. So at the bottom, you can see that we have the word submit. Fortunately, Concrete 5 does a lot of this work for us. Form instructions should be at the top of the form to help users understand how to complete the form and individual form controls. Each element must be fully described as well. And then validating input, validate input provided by the user and can provide options to undo changes and to confirm data entry. So for example, on this email address form field element, if I type in something without an at sign, the validator says, this is not a valid email address. And you can see how that might be important for, um, for users who are using this with adaptive technology. And then the carousel, or as we call it on Concrete 5, the slider, users must be able to pause the carousel movement because it can be too fast or distracting and making it hard to, making text hard to read. All functionality, including navigating between carousel items, must be operable by the keyboard. Changes to carousel items must be communicated to all users, including screen readers, screen reader users. The keyboard position or focus is managed in a reasonable and comprehensible fashion. In concrete, these settings are found under the options tab in the edit image slider function. Here you can set the navigation symbol, the slide duration, and the transition speed. It's important for accessibility that the pause slideshow or hover is enabled. And you can see that down at the bottom of that image there. And I'll show you that in the demo in a little bit. Okay, just lost my... <laughs> Where'd it go? There we are. I'm just about done with my presentation here. So skip through all of these slides. I don't know why it threw me out right there. Oh, because I, I was at the end. Now we're, I'm going to demonstrate um, some of these things in actual Concrete 5 Plow website that we use. OK, 
Okay, I'm trying to get up my website here, just a second. So here we, you can see right at the top, we have the, the carousel showing and um, you should be able to look at your own websites and see the carousel will go into those settings. Also take a look at the information that's found up at the top. And one thing that you can try to do on your own um, website is don't use the mouse, but just use the tab key to move between, um, between sections of your website. So as you can see, I'm just tabbing here and you can also use the tab, uh, shift tab to go back. And this is what I was talking about. So I can move between my menu items just using the keyboard, shift tab going back, but my drop down menus aren't working. But if I keep going, I can get beyond this and go continue going on down. So now you can see my tab is moving here. I'm just hitting the tab key and then I'll go down here goes to live chat and it goes to each one of these buttons. And so you can move around your website by just using the tab buttons. It's a little bit clunky, but it can happen. And that's important to test out because some people do have difficulty using a mouse. So first of all, I'd like to go into my edit mode and I am going to go to the library history page. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the um, elements found in the WYSIWYG editor. So I have a block started here for library history. I'm just gonna edit that block. And since this is a content block, we can see our WYSIWYG editor right there. I'll just add a little bit more content here. So this, we can already see that the word wrapping works and no matter how big or how small our websites get, what device they're read on, this text is responsive. It will wrap correctly, eliminating the need for people to scroll horizontally or um, unlike on a tablet or a phone that will scroll vertically, but it will fit on the screen. Content, concrete CMS, our Plow websites are responsive. And um, if you haven't looked at your own website using a phone or a tablet, do that and see how it changes, but see also how all the content gets laid out a little bit differently, but still makes it easy to navigate using uh, your finger as the touch point. So here we have um, some different things that we can use. The styles, I guess we don't use that one. Here is the different headings. And it's important that you use heading styles, especially when you have a lot of text on your page and make the headings big, either a one or a two, and um, to set them off. So if I wanted to put in here, highlight that. So we type it first, we highlight it, and then we can change that into a heading and see how big that gets. And you can see that it um, is a certain color. It's picking up on the theme color. We can also change the font that we have. If you want to have a font that is a little bit more legible, um, Times New Roman is good on print, but not so good on websites. So the default, I think, is Tahoma. And you can also change it to Arial or one of those other ones. Um, again, to change the font, you select the section that you want to change and then just apply the, the um, font style there. And then the same way that you can change the size of the font and also consider doing this on like a very dense or something that you want um, you want to people to draw people's attention to. So you can change the font size quite easily like that. These other options are, um, this is the text color. And be careful with this. You don't wanna use it too much. We wanna have high contrast always. So it's good to use a dark text color. And then this also is a highlighting color. And this can be used, but sparingly, um, if you wanna do something with high contrast. But 
um, you can see that that also might be a little distracting. So you just want to be careful about how you use that. But I just want to draw your attention to that, that those um, options are all in built in there and that the WYSIWYG editor does a lot of work for us to make our websites accessible. Okay, so that was headers, font, font size, and colors. Now let's talk about images. I'm going to go over to the dashboard and uh, take a look at the files. If you already have images uploaded to your website, um, you can go back and add those alt tags. And remember what I was talking about, what those are used for. Those are alternative tags or descriptors that screen readers use. So instead of seeing a picture, the screen reader will actually say out loud, this is a picture of a tomato. So for example, here, my picture of a tomato. And I'm going to right click and go to the properties. So this is for images that you already have um, uploaded. Down at the bottom, you can see that there's some description and some tags. So the tags will be read by the screen reader. And so I see I have a typo there. This, if you double click on this, it brings up a um, little box and you can just type right in there. This is part of the attributes on these images. So now the screen reader will read that as a bunch of tomatoes. The screen reader will also read the title of this. So if you want to change the title of this um, one, so it's, it is more descriptive. Sometimes you upload a picture and it has this, the, the file name of what the camera gave to you. And so you want to just actually change that. So the screen reader will read that. And then some screen readers will also read this description. And so you wanna make that, um, make that descriptive. Okay, we'll close that out. Let's do another one. Let's go into my peas picture here. So I'm right clicking on this and going to the properties. And then even though this doesn't look like it's editable, if you click on it, you get this little box. So this is, um, Say that one. Tags could include peas. That. And the title is already peas, so that's okay there. And so that's what you do for your images that you have already uploaded. You don't have to go through all of these, but to make your website truly accessible. If you've used these on a web page somewhere, if you've used these images, um, the screen reader, if there's nothing in there, the screen reader jumps over it and your users don't know that, um, what, that it is even on the screen. So if it's just decorative, maybe not so important, but if it's functional, if it's an image to say, get to your Pinterest page or your Instagram page or your Facebook, um, some of those little icons that we use down in the in the bottom. If it's just an image that people should understand what that symbol means, it's a good thing to add those descriptors on there. So now let's go to um, look at our back at our website. We're going to add an image to an existing page. And so on this page, I'm going to add a picture of the book club. And I'll show you then how you can add those tags as you're inserting your image on this, um, on this page. So add an image block here. Now here, down here, you can see that it has a um, place for the alt text and the title. And right as you're pulling in the image. So let's go out here and choose an image, book club. And um, this is uh, something that would show up um, as they hover over it. That's not as important as including this alt text. So here we can say, um, and 
since this is in the HTML, it can just be all lowercase. So screen readers will read all of those um, items. So, the, and this is what we're doing now. We're just adding this image in to um, the web page. And since when the image was uploaded, it didn't include those tags. Now, I, when I put it on the page, so when the screen reader goes by and reads all of this text, they'll also read the image or the information from the um, picture as well. Okay, and then one more thing I wanted to show you about images. Let's go down here to my summer library program. Okay, having difficulty navigating this, even using a mouse. Well, let's try this. Here on my summer library program, I have two images of the posters from from this year's theme. Let's get into edit mode and take a look at that. This one I have already done. So we'll uh, just take a look at that. So when I edit that block, since it's an image block, it's already showing up with the alt text, what it is, and then the title, Reading Colors Your World. So that's all good. And then this one is the same. Let's go ahead and edit this block. So this one doesn't have anything in here. And this is um, this is the name of the of the image. Maybe that's important. This includes the name of the author is what that is. So we can just say um, reading poster again. And reading colors your world. Just use the same ones there. So that's how you can fix up, especially uh, look at your pages and think of which images really need to have those alt tags because that's all there really was on this page. They could read this, they could read that, but there there wasn't, a screen reader wouldn't know that there were just these, these images on here. So that's important, especially on image heavy pages. Okay, now let's go take a look at the carousel slider settings back on the home page. Um, and this, I just want to point out, is an example of high contrast. So this always makes it easier for your users to see um, with visual impairments, use dark text on a light background, plenty of spacing, don't make things too crowded, and um, you can you can use those same alt tags on these images as you're uploading them. So just make sure that you have those alt tags in there and you have your descriptions or a, a very descriptive title of these images as well. So I'm not gonna talk about that in the carousel. Well, let's just get into editing this slider. I wanted to show you these options. So under, here's the list of the slides. And remember, you can move these around by using these um, little uh, grab bars here. You can also remove them and you can add more slides. So we've gone through that in some classes, but what I wanted to focus on today for accessibility purposes are these options. So you should have something turned on for the options. And I had bullets, which were those um, little lines beneath the pictures. You can also use arrows, which appear on the right or the left side, or you can use both, but you probably shouldn't have it set to none. The slide duration isn't so important as long as you have this pause slideshow on hover um, activated. So if somebody is just, um, puts the mouse or it has tabbed over to one, um, unless they move forward, it's gonna, if, they're, um, if their mouse or the tab is sitting on the picture, it stops it from moving forward. You can also disable the automatic slideshow. And we've had a few libraries that just have one or two uh, or just one picture in their carousel and they can just turn that off as well. 
So those are the options for the carousel and those will make your carousel or your slider um, web accessible. All right, the next thing I wanted to do then is look at a form. So, um, so in some one of the classes we went through and we did a library card application as a form and it's pretty easy to add forms in concrete five and the good thing is that that the way that form um, developer is made it has all of the accessibility features um, built into it so we will have the names of the elements and these have to be very clear just make sure these are things that you add actually just make sure that they're descriptive and that um, people will know if they're having a screen read to them or if they are having um, and then and that they're moving through them we talked about the web or the validator so this one actually has a validator turned on and so this one, I actually had to go in and add an introduction because it says library card application, but we wanna have a little bit more information about why we have this library card application, how the library is gonna use the information collected, why it's important to have it and so forth. So people understand what the form is all about. And then we'll just go in and take a look at the form itself. So under edit, you can see where all the fields are named. You can always go back and change the name of the field if it isn't quite um, descriptive enough. And make things not required. You can also change the order. So if I wanted to move this email address up, uh, up there, that would be fine. I can do that first thing. Um, and then there are some options in here. The CAPTCHA, this is the button label that we talked about. And so that has to be very clear. So this one, it could be changed to send to the library. So that's gonna be the name of the button. And unfortunately, we can't change the size of those buttons. That was one thing that um, the, the WCAG guidelines asked us to do is be able to make those buttons big so people that are using their fingers on a phone or using a tab using a keyboard are able to see them a little bit better but we can't change that so that's one limitation but there is the the button down there then um, with the submission button okay so um I did talk a little bit about the services drop down tag that doesn't um, that doesn't seem to work very well and i'll i'll find out about that i'm i'm just not quite sure why it was um, why those that wasn't made so that uh, people with using a keyboard could tab through these services as well, but one thing that they can get to is this and and um, tag or the tabbing just without using a mouse does work on this. So if I just go tab through on this page, I will be able to get to them. But the other thing is when I get to using these blocks, they have to be linked up. So this is one of the things that we talked about in class a couple of times that all the services that you have, this list, which you get to just by clicking on the word services should match this list and should lead directly to those pages. So just make sure that the links on this uh, on these work and you just um, do that by editing the block and adding the link to the page. So um, just choose that page. Services, ask a librarian. And that one is done. So just make sure that those are linked up. Okay. So that is what I had for the content of today's class about web accessibility. And I do see there are some comments or questions in the chat. So I'll take those right now. Maybe it's mostly people just saying hi. <laughs> so, okay, does anybody have any questions for me? 
Yeah, I think a lot of those, Marie, are me um, asking okay. people their names. So uh, yeah, okay. Very I have good. been keeping an eye. I haven't seen too much okay. uh, come through. But if folks do have questions for Marie, now's the time to ask. I'm curious if you uh, found out, Marie, in your research, what uh, you mentioned Times New Roman, good for print, not good on web. Do you have a recommendation of a font that is um, is better for yeah, web? Any, any, probably any sans serif is okay. good for, for web, web reading. So Ariel or Tahoma, one of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will say too, I think to your point of, you know, these features make things easier for everyone. You know, so often when you have, um, you know, an action button, for example, it's nice to just hover over it to kind of, as, you know, as a, even as a non-screen reader user person mm -hmm. uh, to, to get a sense of where am I headed if I'm going to click this or, um, you know, what is that a picture of? I can't quite make it out. It's very tiny or something like that. Yeah, that's right. We can all, all use that. And, and definitely um, being able to pause a slideshow. <laughs> Yeah. as an easily distracted person um is, is <laughs> yeah nice, and so. and i would say that to that point about the posters many of our libraries using concrete have uh, begun to design posters in canva however many of the posters that i see that end up in the slider on the front page are really dense there's a lot of information on them and for really those that go by pretty quickly it's it's not um it's not the best design, so it would be better to use the high contrast, a uh, few words, uh, maybe a picture or two, but not, not much content on those sliders. Mm -hmm. Use more sliders if you have to. Um, we generally say no more than five or six sliders. Otherwise, people oh, yeah. are, don't um, pay any attention. They just they go on by for right. those. Or if I think people are getting more used to it now, but initially it was like you had to sit there and watch for the one you wanted to come back around yeah. or yeah. something. But I think now people see the action buttons a little more, more readily and know how to navigate through those. Yeah, and that um, just, as I said, for our concrete or for our plow users, make sure that those are turned on because I don't think they yes. were on by default and so oh, okay. you have to go in there as you're um, editing that slider mm -hmm. um, to make sure that those yeah. are yeah and then I think too with those you know so part of having the um a little bit of text is a clear way to get more information and that's just I mean that's not necessarily for accessibility but mm -hmm. um there is a question in the chat um have there been classes about these types of graphic design tips? I'm a designer myself, but no, it could be really helpful for people. I know if you head into Iowa Learns and search for presentation pointers, um, Bonnie and Becky, I believe, did a series on that. And then you're going to find tons and tons of stuff on the general web, too. So mm -hmm. um, I'll put that in the chat as well. But are there is Marie, do you have any? thoughts on does canva have resources that you're aware of uh for, for designing graphic design those? generally yes uh and you can you can get a free account at canva in fact in our um concrete five instructions on the state library's website i have a little video showing how to design a poster for the carousel using canva so you can watch that and it's a certain size. It's 1200 by I think 468 is the recommended size. So we start with a canvas of that size and then design it adding a background. So um, there's instruct written instructions and a little video about that. On the, oh, nice. I think website. Concrete 5 is a little picky about its image sizes, isn't it? That it kind of wants you to start with the right size and not use the HTML to resize it. Right, it's especially with the slider because that mm -hmm. was uh, specifically designed. And because we're working on a responsive website that um, pictures have to be uh, able to be resized um, quickly. And so mm -hmm. by uh, adhering to the correct sizes for display, it makes it a lot easier for everybody on that. And I'm gonna put in the chat as well, a link to a presentation that we did um, at the end of April with the Iowa Library for the Blind and Print Disabled, where they actually demo how the screen reader software sounds. Um, so if you, and also have some great pointers on how you can test that out. So if you have screen readers installed on your public PCs, um, which of course we recommend, um, you can 
test your website, that kind of thing. So, um, but there's lots of information on that in that YouTube video as well. So you can hear what it sounds like when you put a file name in that image and add tags and, and all that stuff. And all this Good. stuff too, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, but contributes to your website's own standing in, in Google and other search algorithms, yeah. right? So the better Absolutely. you support your your website with all of these tags and all this additional image, the more likely that Google is to say, oh, this yeah. is a legitimate website. This is a great website. We should definitely put this at the top of our rankings and, <laughs> and yeah. refer people there. So yeah, again, accessibility helping uh, not only you, uh, not only your um, all your users, but but your library as well. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. And I will put a plug in now for our ARPA grant program that we have that we're running right now. So you can definitely use money from that grant to pay for screen readers or for um, special specialty keyboards or even a whole workstation that you can put in your library. All of those would be allowable expenses because we're talking about digital inclusion and certainly disabled people fit into that. We want to be able to serve them as well. So not just for your own website, fixing it up, but for, um, for people of the community to come into your library to surf the web and use a, an assistive device like that. So um, definitely an allowable expense. And hopefully you're thinking about what you're going to spend your $5,000 on and get your applications in. Excellent. Yeah, I put a link to the um, info about ARPA grants in the chat as well. But hopefully you guys have all seen that. If you don't have info on that, your director should, um, if you're not the director. But um, so much so many opportunities with that money and we really do want everyone to take advantage of that. Yeah, sure. All right, we have a th one thank you message. Are there any other questions from folks um, as we wrap up today? If people do have additional questions, Marie, is there LRT available to help them with this? Are you, who should they reach uh, out to? Yes, reach out to the LRT and she can escalate it to me if she's unable to help. But um, for just, general maintenance on the website, your LRT is your go-to person. They have been trained up. They're all experts on the uh, Concrete 5 websites. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Marie. Um, and best of luck uh, to your graduate this year. Okay, thank and thanks for taking time to do this with us today. Sure. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, um, we will send the slides out to all attendees um, after we get our presentation, after we get our attendance marked off in Iowa Learns. Um, so we'll grab the attendee list from Zoom mark off your attendance in the LMS and send you a note along with the slides when everything is ready to go. So be on the lookout for that uh, from a member of our team. So thanks very much um, everyone for joining us today and um, stay dry. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.